Paul writes these vital words to the Corinthians and indeed to all believers. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. We're not going to sing our first psalm, although again the elders will be talking about what we think is the, the safest procedure. I'm just going to read the words of the first psalm, but if you have a psalm book there, please turn with me to Psalm 94. It's on page 222 of the psalm books. And I'm going to read stanzas 5 to 7 and then stanzas 10 to 12. This is quite a singular psalm. There's not very many other psalms like it. But it is telling us that the world is full of trouble. And because of that, we can get our eyes off God. We can begin to sink into the troubles of the world. And certainly we're going to be looking at Thomas today. And Thomas knew all about that. We need to remind ourselves of the truths. The, the fundamental truths that hold us up. Stanza 5. God has made us. He hears all we say. He sees all we do. And Thomas, in fact, will be learning that as well. He will do what's right. God is the one who disciplines us. He chastises us when we need it to make us more like Jesus. And we can see in the, the closing stanzas, there's a focus on Jesus. When my anxious thoughts are many, how your comforts cheer my soul. And Jesus could have sung those words. As we move into stanza 11, Pilate did conspire against him. Pilate did kill the just one. Although through that death and through his resurrection, righteousness is available for all who will trust in him. God will do what's right, and we need to be doing the same. So let me read stanzas 5 to 7, and then stanzas 10 to 12, and then we'll pray together. Does he who the ear made hear not, who formed eyes does he not see? Chastening nations does he judge not, one who shows man truth is he. All the thoughts of man the Lord knows, knows that but a breath are they. Bless the man whom you chastise, Lord, whom you teach in your law's way. Give him rest from days of strife, till wicked men in pit are thrown. Our Lord will not leave his people or his heritage disown. Stanza 10. If I say my foot is slipping, Lord, your love will me uphold. When my anxious thoughts are many, how your comforts cheer my soul. Will destructive judges join you, who by statute misery build? They conspire against the righteous, sentence just ones to be killed. But the Lord my God's my stronghold, rock of refuge, he'll repay. Bring back on them all their evil. Them the Lord our God will slay. Let's stand together as we would talk to God in prayer. Let's all pray. Our Father in heaven, we can only approach you today through a perfect person, through a perfect work, Indeed, through the person of Jesus and through the work of Jesus, which he finished on the cross, we are not worthy to come into your presence ourselves, but Jesus is, and we come to you today through him. We want to praise you for those words we have just been reading together. You have made each one of us 
You have given us ears to hear your word read. You have given us eyes to see this world that you have made in its beauty, how regular it is, how constantly day follows night. We thank you that you take such intimate interest in this, your world. We couldn't breathe another breath unless you gave us power. Father, we thank you for the warmth and for the brightness of today. It reminds us of the warmth of your love, which is always there, even when we don't feel it. You know our thoughts, and yet, amazingly, mysteriously, you want to know us better. You Sin to you today. We'll soon be thinking about Thomas and about his struggles. It's easy to condemn him for isolating himself, for his refusal to believe. But we are possibly more like Thomas than we would care to think. You know that we too can be dull. We often have to learn the same lesson many times before we move on. As we have been singing, we are anxious in our spirits. Some of us are prone to dark moods. We think that nothing's going to work out right. And that seems to have been Thomas's frame of mind. And Satan can sometimes come at us through our temperament. You know that we can have questions about how you're running the world. And we can sometimes allow those things to get us down. Our faith can burn low. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for these things. That you would lift up our heads today. That you would show us your grace and your mercy to someone who is undeserving. We do thank you today for Jesus. You were chastising him not for his sin, but for our sin. We know that Jesus was rightly anxious in Gethsemane about being separated from you. But we thank you that Jesus was willing to endure that. Jesus was willing to go through hell itself for the joy of knowing that that would set many free from our rebellion, from the hopeless future that we would otherwise face. We thank you that you raised him on the third day to show that he is God, to show that he has paid for all the sin of all his people. He has opened your kingdom, your kingdom that will never end. And he was raised from the dead so that you might declare many people righteous, so that you might raise us to resurrection life. Father, we pray that as we meet together around your word today, that you will speak to us of Jesus and help each one of us in response to be able to say what Thomas said of Jesus, my Lord and my God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, whatever format it may be, either in book form or on your phone or whatever, please turn with me to John's Gospel account and chapter 20. Gospel according to John and chapter 20. If you're using the Maroon Bibles that the hotel supplies here, it's page 1141. 1141. John chapter 20. I'm going to read from verse 19, but later on we're really going to concentrate from verse 24 on. Verse 19, that section will give us an introduction. And just a few things to be thinking about as we read these verses together. What kind of person do you think Thomas is from what you know about him? 
in Scripture. There's not an awful lot of information, but there is some. Is Thomas right or is Thomas wrong not to believe that Jesus is risen? And how then does Thomas come to believe that central truth? What about us? How do we come to believe that same truth? John chapter 20 from verse 19. This is God's word. On the evening of that first day of the week, that's the day when Jesus rose, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. May God bless to us the reading and also the preaching of his own perfect and powerful word. I, I don't expect uh, Thomas or, or Samuel or Lydia to come down to the front, but I'll talk to you just where you are. I've just got a couple of things I want to show you as well. Just for a few minutes, Thomas, then you can go back to that. Okay, we have talked about Samuel before from the Old Testament. And how God called him when he was still a young boy. And today we have just read a Bible passage with another of your names in it. The name Thomas. Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples. You know how many disciples Jesus had? How many disciples did Jesus have? Was it five or six, or was it more than that? Twelve, that's right, Samuel. Jesus had twelve disciples. And we know two things about Thomas. And it's only John who tells us these things. Maybe Thomas was John's particular friend. On, on one occasion, Jesus was wanting to go back to Jerusalem to see his friend Lazarus, because he heard that Lazarus was very sick. Thomas knew that this was dangerous to go back to Jerusalem, but he didn't want to tell Jesus not to go. Thomas was faithful to Jesus, 
and wanted to go where Jesus led. So he said to the disciples, let us go with him, that we may die with him. Because he knew that Jesus had talked about dying and rising again. So Thomas was faithful, but he wasn't very hopeful. And then the other thing we know, at the Last Supper, Jesus was talking about going away. And he said that they knew where he was going. Thomas was the one who wisely spoke up. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Thomas was honest. Thomas was also confused. He was in the dark. He didn't understand why Jesus was going away. So when they arrested Jesus that same night, Thomas ran away with the other disciples. He probably hid somewhere for fear that they would come looking for him. He probably didn't even see Jesus' death. From what the Bible says, who's the only one disciple who was at the cross when Jesus died? You know, he was the only one of the disciples who was at the cross. There were quite a number of the women who were there, but only one of them, the men disciples. It's the one whose book we've just been reading. John. John was the only disciple who was at the cross. And now at this point, Thomas has actually taken himself away completely from the disciples. And that's not a good idea. So Thomas wasn't there when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. The doors were locked. They were still afraid that they might be arrested. And suddenly Jesus appeared in the room with them. He didn't need to open the door. He did still have a body, but it was a different kind of body. He was able just to, to pass through the door as if it wasn't there. And the other disciples, whenever they saw Jesus and talked to him and realized he was alive again, they went and they found Thomas. And they told Thomas that Jesus was risen. What great news. What did Thomas say? Did Thomas believe the other disciples? Let me show you a picture of what he, he said. This might help, help you to, to understand what he said. What do you think Thomas said from that picture? He said no, exactly. He said no way. I don't believe that Jesus is risen. And then he even said some rather silly things. He heard the disciples talking about the nail marks in Jesus' hands and the, the wound in Jesus' side because they were still there. And he said this, he said, unless I put my finger in the nail marks, unless I put my hand in the hole in Jesus' side, I will not believe. That was a rather silly thing that he said because the other disciples didn't need to do that. So one week later, Jesus appeared again. And this time, the good news is, Thomas was there. He decided he wanted to see if Jesus would appear. And Jesus did appear. What did he say to Thomas? He said, Thomas, take your finger and put it in the nail marks in my wrists. Take your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. That's what Jesus said. And look, that's how Thomas responded. I think Thomas didn't touch Jesus at all. I think Thomas realized how silly he had been in what he said. I think he maybe fell on his knees and he said to Jesus, my Lord, my master, and my God. He realized that Jesus wasn't just an ordinary human being, he's also God. 
That was a great thing he said. And Jesus praised him for saying that. And that's really the high point of John's whole gospel. There's the the words, my Lord and my God. And that's what Jesus wants each one of us to believe about him. Now the thing is, we can't see Jesus today. Thomas and all the other disciples could see Jesus standing there in front of them. But these things have been written and these things have been kept for us so that we can believe the same as Thomas and the same as Peter and James and John. That we can believe that Jesus is the Savior. We can ask him to forgive our sin and ask him to give us his spirit to help us to love him and to follow him. That would be a great thing if you, Samuel, and you, Thomas, especially with that name, Thomas, and you, Lydia, could come to love and trust this risen Jesus and call him my Lord, my Master, my God, my Savior, because then you could pass that message on to others. That's the best news in the world, that we have a Savior who will be with us forever. So thank you for listening so well and for answering so well. As we would come to God's word, let's just bow as as just where you're sitting and let's just pray for a moment. Let's talk to God. Our Father, we do thank you for what we've just been reading about Thomas. We thank you for how kind Jesus was to bring Thomas to believe that he had risen and that his whole life could be changed as a result. Our Father, we do thank you for our families, especially during lockdown, when we have been much more on our own. Lord, you know that maybe other family members may have annoyed us at times, but at the same time they have kept us sane. We can read your word to us together. We can encourage one another in the faith. Lord, we do want to pray for those connected to our fellowship who are on their own and who are under special pressures because of that. Like Thomas, forgive us for not making as much contact with them as we should have done. We do pray that you would be with Marguerite today. We pray that she may soon be among our number again. We pray too for Peter Bradley. We do thank you that Peter is following these services on his computer. We do pray that you would speak to him from your word. And Father, we do thank you for guiding and being with Hannah and with James, especially during this past week. We pray that you would be with them as they would think now about what the next stage will be of their lives and of their careers. And we pray that you will go with them into that next stage. And Father, as we come to your word now, we pray that you would speak tender and reassuring words to each of our hearts and that we would in turn take this great news that Jesus is risen to other people who need to hear, who may be in despair, and who need to turn and to trust in him for themselves. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So please do have John chapter 20 open in front of you as we spend a few minutes looking at it together. I'm sorry we haven't been able to come to the Lord's table today. It was perhaps rather rash of me to suggest it. 
But each time we have had communion here, we've been looking at Jesus parting words to the disciples in John chapters 13 to 16. So for our first time back in this room, I didn't want to move too far away from John. And we're looking today, really, at what is the high point of John's Gospel, although it does come in a rather unexpected way. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to the whole of Christianity. As such, it's a good thing to focus on at the beginning of what we pray is a new chapter in our fellowship. I opened the service by reading from 1 Corinthians 15. Let me just read you those words again. For what I received, Paul says, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. Jesus' death for sin and his rising from the dead are matters of first importance. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there's no point in us being here, in us continuing one minute longer. But if he did rise, what difference does that make? That's what I want to call this sermon, the difference the risen Jesus makes. And there's no way we can cover all of that in one sermon, but we can talk about some of these things. The difference the risen Jesus makes. And we did look a little bit at John chapter 20 around Easter time. We did certainly see, I think, with the children in verse 7 of John chapter 20, that the message from the folded cloth that had been round Jesus' head was to show that Jesus had finished with death. He had finished with the grave clothes. He had beaten death. Do you believe that Jesus has pulled the sting of your own death? I know that death is something that people fear probably more than anything else. As we move on from that first passage to the lovely moments in the garden, between Mary Magdalene and Jesus, we learn something more. Because of her grief, Mary cannot see anything or grasp anything until Jesus speaks to her in familiar tones. If you look at verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, as he said earlier to his disciples, he calls his own sheep by name. He knows us, and because he's risen, he wants to have this intimate relationship with us as members of his eternal kingdom. And then we have a third thing in those verses that we read earlier, Jesus appearing to the disciples. And it's Sinclair Ferguson who I heard explaining that double saying. Jesus says it in verse 19. And he repeats it in verse 21. Peace be with you. And these are the words the high priest spoke when he came back saved on the day of atonement from offering the blood of sacrifice in the most holy place. If you have believed that Jesus has offered up his life blood for you, then God's blessing is upon you. Jesus brings you peace with God. And he wants to commission you. In verse 23. Now, verse 23 has nothing to do with the confessional box. Some people may try to tell you that it does. 
But the question is, what do the disciples actually do when they hear Jesus say this? They take the good news about Jesus into all the world. So those who repent of their sins, who believe in Jesus, receive the forgiveness that Jesus speaks of here. And those who refuse to believe live on in death. Jesus' resurrection is what propels the mission to the world. And then in the closing verses of the chapter, Jesus shows his power and his love for his own. And that's what we come to now. Could I ask you today, and I know that you will answer yes, but I just want to ask you to confirm in your own heart, do you believe that Jesus has risen from the dead? And what difference has that made to your life? In this section, from verse 24 on, Jesus deals gently but firmly with, with one who is in particular trouble. And I hope that what we read here will speak to your heart today. Because I think many of us have Thomas's tendencies. Peter seems to be an optimist. Thomas, I would say, is at the other end of the scale. He seems to be a pessimist. Most often the glass is half empty. Let's just break these verses down into two parts. Firstly, how Thomas believes. How Thomas believes. Verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. For some reason, Thomas, the twin, so there was obviously some, someone else who was the very same age as him, for some reason he's missing when Jesus first appears to the disciples. I don't want to make too much of this, but I do think that John means us to stop for a moment because he describes Thomas as one of the twelve. His proper place is with the twelve or with the eleven, now that Judas has gone. What kind of man is Thomas? What else do we know about him? I was trying to say some of this to Samuel and Thomas and Lydia a few minutes ago. John is the one who gives us a bit more insight. So please turn back with me for a moment to John chapter 11, page 1129. And in the opening verses of John 11, there's talk that Lazarus, Jesus' friend, is sick. Jesus means to go to see him. But in verse 8, we can see that the disciples know the danger. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there. Jesus then tells them in verse 14 that Lazarus is dead. And his intention in verse 15 is to strengthen the disciples' faith. But if you notice in verse 16, Thomas doesn't read it like that. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Those words show a mixture of boldness to go with Jesus, but also despair to die with him. He does seem to have understood that Jesus has to die. But he can't see what good it's going to do. The whole thing is going to come to a bad end anyway, isn't it? I think Thomas sounds a bit like Eeyore here. The miserable donkey walking round with a dark cloud over his head. We may smile at the thought of Eeyore. But it's not so pleasant either to be an Eeyore or to live with an Eeyore. 
he needs to try to curb this glass is half empty mindset by believing that Jesus does know what he's doing at every step by staying close to him and so may you please don't use your personality whatever kind of personality God has given you as an excuse for sin John's other mention of Thomas comes in the upper room in chapter 14 you want to turn over to page 1134 those well-known words at the beginning of John 14 in verse 3 Jesus tells the disciples he's leaving them he says they know where he's going because he's been talking about it often enough they know the way it's going to happen but then Thomas objects in verse 5 Thomas said to him Lord we don't know where you're going so how can we know the way? This thought of being separated from the one he trusts and loves is more than he can bear. He's all in a muddle and he just blurts out his fears. And I think we can be thankful for Thomas here because if Thomas hadn't said what he did, I don't think we would have the tremendous answer that Jesus gives in verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way to the Father, to heaven, the only way. He can see it all. Thomas can't. Do you believe Jesus' words today? And then it does happen. Jesus' enemies arrest him. There's a mockery of a trial. And then he's brutally executed the very next morning before anything else can be done. That's the end of it. The bubble has burst. The dream is over. What's the point? And this is what's going on in Thomas's mind. What's the point in carrying on? <clears throat> Why should I continue to be associated with these now friendless, almost headless disciples. But beware of copying Thomas's actions. We are encouraged elsewhere not to give up meeting together. I know it's been much more difficult in recent months. Even when feelings, even when the danger of infection might make us give up meeting together came across this statement the other day. But even though we're often bugged by other believers, you can tell the person who's writing is an American, even though we're often bugged by other believers, the fact is, we need them. Can you fight the thoughts and the fears that have gripped Thomas's mind on your own, as far as he's concerned, Jesus is dead and buried, and that's an end of it. If a fire is going out, you draw the dying coals together to keep them burning. It's Satan who wants to separate us, to cut us off from one another. Like a crafty lion moving in for the kill, he likes to isolate his victims before he destroys them. Lockdown has made its contribution to keeping us apart. But do be aware of the dangers of that. If you're away from the worship of God, as Thomas is, <clears throat> if you're away from the company of God's people, you may miss certain buffetings. But you will miss blessings as well. Thomas certainly misses out here. Look at verse 25. So the other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Jesus comes when Thomas is not there. It says the other disciples told him. It would better say they kept on telling him. Because Thomas refuses point blank to believe them. And he puts that refusal into words. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands 
and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Hot, angry, maybe even jealous words. The climax is very strong. I will not believe it. I think today we might say, no way will I believe it. People call him Doubting Thomas. I think he's rather unbelieving Thomas here. Refusing to believe Jesus' own promise, which he made time and again. Each time Jesus spoke about his death, he also said he would rise again on the third day. Refusing to accept his own friend's fresh testimony. And laying down these precise, gory conditions before he'll change his mind. You see what trouble going away from Jesus, even just in your mind, can land you in. We can all do that. Even if outwardly it looks as if we're following him, inwardly we may still have reservations about certain things. We may have doubts about what Jesus is doing in our lives. But we all know Thomas is not left in this dark and angry state. And that's simply because of the kindness of Jesus. Verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Jesus leaves the disciples for a week to let his resurrection begin to sink in. I think he's beginning to teach them to meet for worship on the first day of the week to celebrate not so much creation as the Sabbath did, but to celebrate his rising again, a new kind of Sabbath. He leaves Thomas for a troubled week to help Thomas understand what refusing to believe the resurrection will mean for him. And that leaving of Thomas is actually a mark of his grace. That's actually what excommunication, the strongest form of church discipline, is for. To confront us with reality. That without Jesus, without the resurrection, there is no hope. There's no cure for sin, or death, or hell. And with grace and compassion, Jesus repeats his actions of the previous week. You notice the disciples still have the doors locked. Their faith is still pretty flimsy. But again, locks and bolts don't keep Jesus' new body out. And again, that same greeting, peace be with you, that means so much more now. Jesus has borne their punishment on the cross. He has emerged the other side of death. They now have peace with God. No one can take that away. And then Jesus singles out the unbeliever. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. What a beautiful moment this is. Beside the beautiful moment with Mary at the tomb earlier and the beautiful moment with Peter in the next chapter. Now that doesn't mean these moments aren't without pain. Because here in verse 27, Thomas suddenly realizes Jesus himself has heard his hasty words, his heated words of the previous week. How foolish, how proud those words sound now as Jesus speaks them back to him. 
how he'd like to take them back. And Jesus could have torn a strip off Thomas at that point. Jesus has been to death and back for Thomas. But how deeply Thomas' own words rebuke him. Thomas, is my appearing to you not enough? It was for the others. Do you need special proof that death has marked me, but that I have shattered it? Come ahead, Thomas, carry out your tests. I submit myself to you. How that must have hurt. As those words sting Thomas's heart, fighting back tears of shame, he falls to his knees and confesses, My Lord and my God. Face to face with the Lord, all his angry demands just melt away. And surely sometimes don't ours too. Jesus isn't dismissing Thomas's need for evidence. Rather, Thomas hasn't believed the evidence already in front of him. The evidence of his friend's testimony and their changed lives. The evidence of Jesus' prediction. I do think the fact that Thomas is there that second week, it shows that he does want to believe. Maybe it shows he doesn't want to be conned into something that isn't actually real. But becoming a Christian isn't like writing out a list of problems you have that you want God to solve. The problem of suffering, the problem of natural disasters, the problem of those who haven't heard the gospel, the evil of Islamic terrorism, to name a few. And only after God has sorted out each one will you allow him access to your life. It's not like that. Because then it depends on your intelligence, your ability to work out the answers. Because you're still in charge then. Becoming a Christian is far more like what happens to Thomas here. And Thomas was already a believer. But you wouldn't have known it from how he's behaving. It's more like being confronted with a person. All of a sudden, a person whose claims you can no longer resist. It's like the scales being taken from your eyes so you can see clearly who Jesus is and what that really means. And you actually notice the importance of seeing in this chapter. It's a, it's a repeated note that keeps coming through. In verse 8, we're told John saw and believed. In verse 18, Mary bursts in with the words, I have seen the Lord. And the disciples say the very same thing to Thomas in verse 25. It's pretty obvious what all this means for Thomas. He doesn't say to Jesus in some matter of fact, some offhand way, Well, Jesus, I'm glad to see you're alive again. That cross was very unfair. But things seem to have worked out all right in the end. Now Thomas has made a lot of Jesus' wounds, which he may not even have seen. I think that shows how crushing Jesus' death has been to him. But with a rush of conviction, as he sees the risen Jesus in front of him, he sees that he is involved here, that those hands, that that side were punctured for him, that this is no less than the greatest person in the universe, and that he's related to him. He doesn't just say, you are the Lord, you are God incarnate. He says, my Lord, my God, I have a, a share in who you are. 
Although he has cut himself off from the others, he's probably gone down deeper and darker than they. In God's mercy, he comes up with the richest pearl, with what is the climax of this account. My Lord and my God. None of the others has said this. But that's what Thomas believes now with all his heart. And Jesus has been so gracious in coaxing it out. In his wonderful economy, the more sin, the more doubt we may experience, the lower Jesus comes down to reach us and brings us to confess the highest. But maybe you're thinking all along, well, Thomas has an advantage that I don't have, and that's true. Thomas actually sees Jesus with his own eyes. We cannot. But Jesus himself would not agree. Many people saw him in the flesh. Many people were there at his miracles. But they did not believe in him. Look on to verse 29. Then Jesus told Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's a word for all the generations that will follow who have not seen the risen Jesus. There's something more to this believing than just seeing. So many people these days are stuck where Thomas was. They claim that seeing is believing. If I see the wounds, if I can feel them, then I'll believe. They want visible proof. This is where we must move from Thomas to ourselves to consider how we believe. How we believe. And that's the second point that I want to look at just briefly. You see, John would actually tell us it's the other way around. Not seeing is believing, but believing is seeing. Just think for a minute about how you develop a relationship with someone. First of all, you observe that person and get to know something of what he or she is really like. Then you form a set of beliefs about that person, about their character, their habits, their likes and dislikes. Is this someone you can get on with or not? Is this someone with similar values and attitudes to you? That's all kind of academic from a distance. But it's only when you trust yourself to that person that you really get to know him or her that a relationship begins to develop. Don't listen what others say about the person. Sometimes their reports may be helpful and accurate. Sometimes they may be biased. Find out for yourself. So it is with true faith. Now John actually avoids using the word faith in his gospel. He prefers most of the time to talk about believing. It's not something you have. It's something you do. You believe. Verse 13. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. It's not John's intention to give us a big, thick biography of Jesus. In fact, you can read John's Gospel in about two hours. But he does have a very definite point in all he writes. Look at verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is presenting you and me with first-hand information about this person, Jesus. He wants to introduce Jesus to you. And as you read, you will form a set of beliefs based on what John says. 
what kind of person this is. But John is after more than that. He wants you to trust all of yourself to all that Jesus is. And look at what he says about Jesus here. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the one promised from of old, fully man and fully God, the one to take your punishment, believer, the one to make your life into something worthy for him. You'll never believe with a saving faith until God opens the eyes of your heart and mind. Unless you see yourself as a person who prefers the dark, who likes to cut yourself off from others, a person who's ashamed of things you've done and said and thought, as Thomas was, a person who's wanted to live your life apart from this Jesus, but you will believe as soon as he so reveals himself to you. Often it comes as such a surprise. You wonder why you never saw it before. And as you learn to trust him more and more, as you read about him in his word, you'll see so much more in him than you ever thought possible. John talks there about miraculous signs. The thing is, we don't need any more signs. But we do need more of him through his word that tells us about the signs. In other words, with Jesus, believing is seeing. And quite simply, he will become, if he's not already, the most important person in the world. Hopefully by this stage, you will see and you will agree with Thomas that he is your Lord and your God, your captain, your master, your creator, your savior. He received those wounds to buy you back, to remake you. If you're not yet a Christian today, I'm not aware that there are very many in this room who are not Christians, but there may be others who may be watching us later, then you're still blind to who Jesus really is. You may have even questioned the existence of God, but if you refuse to accept the evidence, the evidence of Christians, Christians you know, what lies before you is not Thomas's end, but Judas's end. Despair, disaster, destruction. Why not ask God to help you wholeheartedly to believe in this Jesus who died and rose again for sinners like you? Because then he will hold you firmly as he came to hold Thomas for now and forever. If you're already a Christian, I know that most of you here are today. Don't be dismayed by all those people around you who would mock your faith, who would ask for proof. Two things alone God will use to convince them. Firstly, your clear presentation of this risen Christ, still marked with the wounds of love. And secondly, the evidence from your own life that the questioning, the doubting, has become believing that this Jesus is now your Lord and your God. You and I don't need to see the risen Jesus in the flesh. Yet, we don't need to put our fingers into the nail prints. But you do need to believe what John, what God has written here, that Jesus is God's answer to sin. He is the Christ. He is God in the flesh. 
that he has lived, he has died, he is risen again for you. If you believe like that on Jesus' authority in these words, I can say to you today, you have eternal life in him. Let's stand as we would pray together. Our Father, we do thank you for this lovely passage that we've been considering. We thank you for the difference the risen Jesus makes. We thank you, Jesus, for your patience with stubborn, unbelieving Thomas. Help those of us who say we believe not to waver, not to be prey to doubt, even to self-pity in some of our, our own particular troubles and situations. Help us instead to be looking for signs in your word, pointing us to Jesus, to all he is, to all he does for his people. May our lives be real so that others can see that faith has replaced doubting, that they too will come to love him. And Lord, we do pray for any not yet believers that they would go on thinking about this encounter, about this Jesus who died on the cross and who rose again. We pray that you would give them no peace till they come to believe in Jesus for themselves and trust themselves to him so that he also becomes their Lord, their Savior, their God. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We close our service by singing part of Psalm 84a together. Page 187. Psalm 84a, we're going to sing stanzas 1 and 2, and then stanza 5, and then the last two stanzas 9 and 10. So 1 and 2, 5 and 9 and 10. And we sing this to the tune Kidron number 104. It is good as this psalm celebrates. It's good to come together to worship God. And this psalm is, is giving us a picture of God's people journeying to the temple to worship him, longing for God, longing for fellowship with other believers, led by Jesus, fed by his word. And it stands a five would tell us that in such a situation, even the hard things can be turned into what is good for us. And then in, in stanza nine, we have the Old Testament equivalent to Romans 8 and 28, God working all things for the good of those who love him. God will not withhold anything that is good from those who uprightly live and trust in him. So let us live by faith in him this week and see what he can do for us and through us. Psalm 84a stands as 1 and 2, 5 and 9 and 10. Let's praise God.
Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.